All right. Um, so I'm going to now sort of uh, move on to a panel with two um, very smart UN insiders, and we're going to be talking about issues of peace building and conflict. And um, I'll introduce first, um, I, I have Kate Phillips Barrasso for the Vice President of Global Policy and Advocacy at Mercy Corps. You can come on up. And Richard Gowan, the um, UN experts, probably the most quoted person in this kind of community at the International Crisis Group also as well. So why don't I move over? Why don't you two sit there? And I will, yeah, I'll sit over here. All right, well, thank you for coming. Um, so on this panel, we're gonna talk much more about conflict. So why don't we start out? Um, you know, we're looking, we're witnessing a period in which the sort of whole system of collective security seems to be in retreat. Uh, the UN Security Council is fractured and in some cases paralyzed. Uh, the whole concept of multilateralism seems to be under threat. Um, and it's not just in Ukraine. We see it in places like Mali, where UN peacekeepers have been replaced by Russian par paramilitary forces from the Wagner Group. The UN Special Envoy for Sudan just announced his resignation. Um, why don't I start with Richard? But Richard, are we entering into a kind of a scary new era of global disorder and what can we do about it? Um, um, and yeah, so why don't you take the floor on that? Well, this is this is clearly going to be a really jolly session. Um, <laughs> look, I think I think we are, to be honest, at the end of an era. I think most people who've worked in our sector for the last 20 or 30 years have been used to a world where the Security Council would agree on most things, if not all things. And we had a toolbox for dealing with conflict involving UN mediation, UN peacekeeping, that was never perfect, sometimes failed, but actually often worked quite well in places like Sierra Leone or Liberia. Well, now we're in a situation where, frankly, some of those tools are not working on the ground. UN peacekeeping was not really working in Mali, even before Mali demanded that the Blue Helmets go. And we have a Security Council that is not totally paralyzed, but is clearly struggling under the weight of geopolitical pressures and is not responding to crises like those in the Sahel or Sudan um, at all. And so I think we need to start rethinking a lot of our basic principles about how we deal with conflict and how we try to prevent conflict. Um, we have some idea what that would look like. I think it involves putting more responsibility and more resources towards organizations like the African Union to deal with conflicts in Africa. But it also involves thinking about how we use non-security resources, very much including aid, more effectively to reduce pressure on states and reduce risks of conflict, which I guess is a focus for many in this room. Okay, we've looked at it, this sort of issue from 30,000 sort of feet perspective. So, um, uh, Kate, you represent an organization that is dealing both, is, is very active on the ground, dealing with this conflict. So you're also very active trying to lobby um, the U.S. government to try to deal with these issues in their own way. And so maybe you can talk about sort of how successful there have been other means to try and you know, prevent these conflicts from beginning or, you know, trying to find other ways to deal with these issues and whether you're very hopeful about um, the future in, in which you don't have the Security Council playing the role that it's been playing traditionally. Right. Well, I mean, I am hopeful, but I feel like this week has probably been a sobering one for a lot of us. Not that any of this was news, but here we're in, gathered in New York special session of the UN General Assembly to talk about progress on the SDGs. And unfortunately, it's not good news, right? I think the, the term was we're 15% of the way there. And, uh, you know, the good news there is I think we all know why. Um, there's, there's several key reasons. But for me, one of the most foundational ones is that you cannot have development unless you have peaceful societies. It's just a no-brainer. A no it's foundational. Um, and much like Amy Pope just said in the previous panel, unfortunately, um, uh, we only see a little bit of investment in things like prevention. Something only like 2% of global aid flows actually go to peace building and conflict reduction, which when you consider 
you know, a situation, for example, like what's going on in Sudan right now, where we're seeing an all out reversal on development progress, something like 70% of health clinics and hospitals are closed, you are not going to reach global development goals on health in that situation or education. So we really are at a moment where I think we have to recognize that all the aid in the world is not going to compensate for a lack of peace. And while you know Richard just talked a bit about the Security Council and these international tools that we have at a multilateral level to bring about those peace, and it's not a great moment on that front, there still is a world of possibility for things that can be done at a much more local level where most people are actually experiencing conflict, right? Conflict between pastoral and agricultural communities, for example. Um, and so one, one bright spot is uh, Mercy Corps has worked a lot with the U.S. government to take a much more action-oriented approach in trying to prevent conflict from the start through the passage of the Global Fragility Act, which is a combination, sort of an interagency approach within the U.S. government in four countries and one region in, in coastal West Africa to try to really get ahead of the drivers of conflict and make sure we don't end up paying a lot of money in humanitarian assistance and seeing the the you know depletion of those development games by getting gains by getting out ahead of things and so i'm hopeful to your question column that we're taking more creative approaches it might not be at the un level but i think the us government in particular is trying to take along a few other governments i'd mentioned germany as one of them and trying to get ahead of this very expensive uh problem that's erasing development gains. right so i i would think that you know in a situation like the war in ukraine no matter what period of history we were in, there would be little prospect that anybody would be able to do anything about it because Russia is a permanent member of the Security Council. It's a big power. It does what it wants, and it can veto any efforts to act against us. But Haiti is, you know, is is not does not have a permanent seat on the Security Council. It wants uh, a UN peace operation. Um, there seems to be at least rhetorical support for the idea, but the UN Security Council can't quite get it together. The big regional players, the US, Canada, Brazil, they don't want to lead anything. They've had bad experiences there. I mean, why, you know, isn't, you know, uh, you know, we, we now have Kenya has stepped forward. There's questions now about um, whether it has the sort of resources to lead such a mission. Um, you know, what, you know, shouldn't, he, shouldn't a country like, Hey, I mean, shouldn't it be something that the UN security council can actually do something about? I think that Haiti is an especially tough case. And I think I'm right in saying there've been eight or nine different UN missions in Haiti over the years. And lots of countries uh, like Brazil have sent peacekeepers there in the past. I, I simply think that there's a lot of wariness because we have seen peace operations come and go in Haiti, um, and the results have never been what we've hoped. Clearly also there is a very, very painful recollection um, that it was UN peacekeepers who brought cholera into Haiti about a decade ago. But I think what we're seeing around Haiti is perhaps the way forward um, in terms of stabilization. We won't have a big blue helmet mission sort of commanded by the Secretary General, but we will cobble together some sort of multilateral force with Kenya at least initially in the lead. It won't look like missions we've had in the past, but it may bring some extra political will um, and it may be enough to at least stem the violence on the ground. I think that whether it's in Haiti or in the Sahel, the future of, the future of peacemaking is going to be messy. It's going to be about bringing together these ad hoc alliances. The question is, do we support those ad hoc, ad hoc alliances, firstly, with political support, and secondly, with financial support? Because if you look at Haiti, it desperately needs financial assistance as well as security assistance. Yeah, so um, also, this is a follow-up, Kate, on Haiti. Um, if you could talk a little bit about, I mean, this is a good example of something where, you know, you know, is there a role for something like the Global Fragility Act? I mean, maybe you could talk a bit about, like, from your perspective. Absolutely. Haiti happens to be one of the GFA-focused countries, right? Which I think, you know, some would question because they say it's already in full-scale conflict. What are we talking about prevention-wise here? But I think a really important point that's not often embraced is that peacekeeping is not peace building, right? There are, there are, I think this is um, maybe perhaps what you're referring to, Richard, in terms of the limitations of peacekeeping forces. There is a time and a place for that. But I think over time, you saw 
sort of the missions of these peacekeeping forces got bigger and bigger, recognizing there were so many things that were absolutely fundamental for them to be able to leave and sort of achieve their mission. So I think as we look at a situation like Haiti, where there have been peacekeeping forces before, clearly one of the things that we got wrong was actually addressing the root causes of governance challenges, violence, whatever the, the, the economy of violence in, in Haiti. So I'm glad that the U.S. government is actually embracing what I also agree is a particularly difficult case and saying we have not approached this correctly in the past. How do we try harder to get it right by combining resources at the right time in the right way beyond just stabilizing through um, some form of an international peacekeeping right. force? So I mentioned this earlier, but Mali, you know, is a case where, as, as you mentioned, uh, the UN has been sort of kicked out of Mali by the government. Sudan, uh, the special representative, the secretary general was declared persona non grata, finally, you know, um, announced his resignation last week. And uh, basically everybody in the mission is going on to do other things. So is there a way back for the UN back in? I mean, these are still very important crises that, you know, the international community, the Security Council has some responsibility to try to act upon. Um, do you see any chance for, you know, a, a kind of way back in to, and, and if so, is there a new strategy that might work better or are these intractable problems? So I think in Sudan, we have to see who is chosen to replace Volker Pertes as the head of the UN mission, but hopefully a new head of mission can come in and start coordinating with other diplomatic actors uh, focused on Sudan, including African mediators, um, the Saudis, the US, and maybe they can bring some life back to UN engagement on Sudan. In the Sahel, I think we have to focus less on Mali, which frankly is almost certainly going to go into war, and more on the states around it. And we have to think what sort of economic support, what sort of governance support can we offer the countries of the West African coastal region to try and reinforce them against, firstly, spillover of jihadi groups, um, which is increasingly obvious across the region, and secondly, the spate of coups that um, we're seeing in the region. This is an area where we need to move fast with money, with governance support, because otherwise we're going to be talking about crises back in countries like Sierra Leone and Liberia, which we thought had made and have made great progress over the last 20 years. So, Kate, um, is this an area, particularly in West Africa, where you're seeing the discussion about, you know, the Fragility Act and uh, preventive, you know, uh, efforts to deal with these issues, whether there's a lot of discussion about that and whether there's any space to do anything? Yeah, it, it, I mean, definitely in the Sahel, particularly in the light of the events of this year, but frankly, these things have been going on for quite some time in that region. And yes, coastal West Africa was um, chosen as a GFA-focused region, recognizing the regional dynamics there are inextricable country by country. But one thing I, you know, just to underscore a previous point referring to Mali, um, you know, Mercy Corps is really guided uh, by the research that we do on our programs and what works. And I think, again, trying to get right peace building in a, in a context like Mali is understanding what are the actual drivers of this conflict. And in our research, it really showed there had been a predominant narrative that, you know, when you're poor, uh, you have uh, people joining insurgent groups, the right ripe for extremism, these sorts of things, these movements we see up in the north, northern parts of a lot of countries in the Sahel. But it really, the research revealed in talking to people who had joined these groups and talking to people who um, were in the communities where this was happening, a lot that they were not feeling included in the economic growth in those right. countries. They did not have access to justice mechanisms and it was breaking down trust with the state in terms of the sort of citizen state contract. But I think the approach has been very much looking at that re region through a preventing violence, violent extremism security lens. And it absolutely has to be a development and human security lens and about social cohesion if we want to actually see conflicts in countries like Burkina Faso and Mali stop. Right. So we don't have much time left, but I wanted to sort of have a final question, which is, you know, when you're dealing particularly in West Africa and you see that the Wagner Group is playing a much more proactive role, you have governments, military governments without sort of democratic legitimacy. How does the humanitarian community, how does the relief community, how do they how do they 
deal with this? I mean, they still have to provide support and aid to communities, but how do you deal with it in this environment? Maybe that's best for you, Kate. Perhaps. I mean, we're, I'll be honest, we're still getting our head around it, right? We have, uh, there are so many access impediments. Again, I mentioned Sudan um, uh, earlier in the conversation, uh, uh, facing humanitarian actors, both in terms of safety and security and just ability to reach these populations and having this layer of additional non international non state armed actors entering the equation definitely complicates that and makes the politics behind uh, knowing who to talk to to negotiate that access much more challenging so it is it has made humanitarian action particularly in certain parts of africa much more treacherous all right well i'm gonna have to cut you off richard i always love to hear from you but we're at zero so um but in any event thank you all for being here and thanks for joining us kate richard really appreciate it that was a great conversation thank you